Hey, Christ Church, good morning. Um, we're so glad you joined us for 15 minutes in the Word. And yes, uh, Jonathan and I do have the same shirt on this morning. Out of all the shirts we could have picked in our closet, we picked the same one. And even last night, we were joking that we might end up wearing the same shirt, and we did. So two ways to look at it. Either John and I are matching, or Matt is not matching with us. Um, I prefer the latter. Yeah. A little less shame for us, right? Yeah. Well, anyways, church, we're so glad you're here. Um, thanks for joining us. Um, we're still in the book of Colossians, and uh, we started it yesterday, and Paul gave us an intro to the book of Colossians. And essentially, what we find here is this is one of Paul's um, prison letters. Um, he never visited the church in, in the Colossians, um, but however, has a deep heart for the people there. And one of the ways to kind of look at this book, one of the big overarching themes is Paul is really pushing so often the, the glory of Christ and our union with him. And we're going to see some of those elements come out even in our passage this morning. And so when we're looking today, we're going to be in chapter 2, starting in verse 6. And what we see in our passage today are kind of three big movements. Um, the, the first two are really where we start seeing some cultural pressures that the church is facing. And one of them is, as a lot of people have left their former way of life, left other gods, kind of Greek and Roman gods, there's still this pull to come back and to worship them and to serve them. And then secondly, we see that from the Jews to the people in Colossae, there's kind of a call to continue observing a lot of the Jewish traditions. And so what Paul does, and he does it wonderfully here in this passage, is he calls them away from those two cultural pressures and back to Christ. And where we see that Christ, he's triumphed over all spiritual powers, and also that Christ fulfilled the law. And the law is, in fact, something that can't change our hearts. Only through the resurrection power of Christ can our hearts be changed. And then when we turn to chapter 3, we're really going to see this call of Paul to the church to live out what it means to be the new humanity, to live out this calling of following Christ. And so we'll get into a lot of practical um, examples of what that looks like. And so, church, before we turn to the Word, um, John, do you mind opening us yeah, in prayer? Absolutely. Father, thank you for your word. I thank you that uh, it points to you. It teaches us not just how to live, but it teaches us how to be connected to you, to live in you, to be rooted and built up in you, Lord. May it change us. Let it not just be knowledge for us, but something that transforms us. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, church, we'll be in Colossians 2, starting in verse 6, and we'll read through chapter 3, verse 17. Colossians 2, verse 6. So then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in Him, rooted and built up in Him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces of this world rather than on Christ. For in Christ Jesus, all the fullness of deity lives in bodily form. And in Christ, you have been brought to fullness. He is the head over every power and authority. In him, you were also circumcised with a circumcision not performed by human hands. Your whole self ruled by the flesh was put off when you were circumcised by Christ having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through your faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross." And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. These are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. Do not let anyone who delights in false humility and the worship of angels disqualify you. Such a person also goes into great detail about what they have seen. They are puffed up with idle notions by their unspiritual mind. They have lost connection with the head, 
from whom the whole body, supported and held together by its ligaments and sinews, grows as God causes it to grow. Since you died with Christ to the elemental, elemental spiritual forces of this world, why, as though you still belong to the world, do you submit to its rules? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. These rules, which have to do with things that are all destined to perish with use, based on mere human commands, and teachings. Such regulations indeed have an appearance of wisdom, but with self-imposed worship, their false humility, and their harsh treatment of the body, but they lack any value in restraining sensual indulgence. Since then, you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is. See that the right hand of God set your minds on things above, not on earthly things, for you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways, in the, in the life you once lived, but now you must also rid yourselves of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other, since you have taken off your old self with its practices and put on your new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. Here there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. Therefore, as God's holy people, chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you, and over all these virtues put on love which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace. And be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Well, as we, I think, find ourselves saying a lot, that's a really good passage. <laughs> yeah. Like a really fun <clears throat> passage. Not only does he help us kind of navigate these cultural pressures to turn away from Christ to other things, but he gets really practical on what we are to look like in light of putting our faith in Christ. Mm -hmm. What is this transformation of the Christian look like? And so as we read through this, we've been kind of moving through three big movements, where we see the heart of God, where do we see ourselves, and where can we apply this to our lives? And so as we begin discussing this passage, guys, what's grabbing you? What's standing out? Well, the very first verse, it says, So then just as you received Christ... And I, I stop right there and I think, how, how did I receive Christ? And I really didn't do anything. If I jump down to verse 13, it says, when you were dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh. And so I did absolutely nothing. And I think we Christians, including myself, are really good at understanding the theology of how I received Christ. I didn't do anything. But then when it starts living, we start living the Christian life, we want to take over and just kind of whatever religion, good works we want to do to earn God's favor. Mm -hmm. But it says, just as you receive Christ, continue to live in him. And that just is a daily surrender of saying, Lord, you're in charge. You, you are, uh, if, as I'm rooted and built up in you, you're filling me with your spirit. You are guiding me. You're directing me. Such an encouragement. Yeah. In many ways, this is kind of the heart <laughs> of Colossians, this, this yeah. one verse, because Paul in chapter one is kind of display, put on display how great Jesus is, right? That, mm -hmm. I mean, he gives us this portrait of the glory of who Christ is. And then this verse right here is like, and this is the Christ you've received. So walk in him, you know, just as you received him, walk in him. And he'll go on to kind of detail out what that looks like practically for us. But I mean, this is the heart of, of the Christian experience, yeah. you know, 
God has taken us from being dead in our trespasses and sins, made us alive in Christ Jesus, and called us to walk in him just as we received him. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think there's the tension of what we see in Colossae at the time is the believers receive Christ, and they're saying, now you need these things. You know, make sure you get these human rules and traditions and the secret knowledge that was there. And, and Paul's right back saying, you got Christ. What else do you need? There mm-hmm. is nothing else. He's the secret. You know, you've got him. And, and I think that's the tension for us is we receive Christ, but then we even fill the pool towards, I know, okay, I, I got Christ, but like, what else? You know, what do I add? And Paul r- reminds us, we got him, walk in him. Yeah, and, and he's the best. You know, there's even this call that, you know, it, 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 in, in even chapter one, we talked about the supremacy of Christ. And then here we get to see that even spelled out a little bit more, how he's triumphed over every spiritual force. So why would you want to serve or give your time to any other God with small g when you have the supreme, you have Christ? And why go back to mere traditions and following these little rules laid out, but you have Christ who is so much greater, so much better. And, and I think that's just a small thing. I mean, I know even in my own life, that, that tendency to value other things, cherish other things, um, want other things besides him um, is there almost every single day. But then to know that if I want to be rooted and I want to be built up and I want to be strengthened, that is all found in mm-hmm. Christ. And I think all of us believers want that. Yeah, and I think that's why right, he begins chapter 3 with, since then you have been raised with Christ. And he'll go and say, set your, your hearts on the things above where Christ is seated, and then set your minds on the things where Christ is seated. You know, because that's the tension for us who are still, you know, living on earth with our eyes constantly gazing on the things of earth. It's so easy to not want to focus our eyes and our hearts above where Christ is. You know, and, and so we, I think we know with our heads at times, like, yeah, all I need is Christ. But then our eyes bounce and our hearts bounce and our affections pull towards so many other things. You know, Paul's writing and saying, man, set your whole person upon Jesus. And I mean, Paul's, you know, Pastor Paul's used this a lot and C.S. Lewis, you know, that when we aim at earth, we lose heaven. But when we mm-hmm. aim at heaven, we get earth thrown in. Mm-hmm. You know, that, I think that's exactly what Paul's saying here is set your eyes and your hearts and your, your minds, right, on Christ. Right. And live in light of that. I, I love that it says since then you've been raised with Christ. Not like, hey, um, if you work hard enough, you're going to be raised with Christ. Or it's like, it's been done. I don't feel raised with Christ. Yeah. It's not my emotion. It's my done. spiritual state. It's been done for me by him, by this work on the cross, by him rising from the dead. But Matt, I, I totally agree with you. I am constantly distracted by my, my affections, my heart, you know, yeah. of, of non-eternal things, things that don't matter. Even this morning, getting up and driving here, thinking about this passage, being distracted by things that are just mm-hmm. going to benefit me. And my mind and my thoughts, am I focusing on things that are eternal and things that, that matter? Am I focusing on, oh, how to gratify myself? So, yeah. And the cool thing, especially when we get into chapter three, and one of ways to kind of start thinking about this is when we see Paul talking about this new life that we've been given in Christ, he really spells out very clearly what that begins to look like. And so you can almost take chapter three and really boil it down to just kind of this phrase of live now what you will one day be. Mm -hmm. Live out that new humanity now. Live out what you're gonna one day become. Because he already says there in chapter three, or chapter chapter 12, as God's chosen, holy, dearly loved people. Mm -hmm. So those things are already ours now. And so that begins to transform and and empower us to actually live in such a way. Because we see these things, right? We want to be clothed in compassion and kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. We wanna bear with one another especially in the times we're in now. We want to see what forgiveness looks like. And he ties that straight back to Christ. And so this is, it gets me excited. Like, what would it look like if we ask God to make us like these people, to, to look like this now? What transformation that might have in our culture? And even that, that list, I'm so tempted to look at that list and go, okay, I'm going to try and be compassionate yeah. today. I'm going to work on that. And I'm going to do all the... And it's not our power. Versus just responding to God's power in my life going, that will be manifested as I walk with him. I will be compassionate. Yeah. I will be humble. Mm-hmm. And you can't, I mean, you can't miss the structure of how he's unfolding these things, right? He begins right. with Christ, set your minds on the things above, and then he gets to kind of the conclusion of this put off, put on. And he says, let the word of Christ, the message of Christ dwell among you richly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, that there is no transformation if the word of God is not dwelling you know, in us, if we're not, essentially, the other way of saying it is, if we're not in the word, 
you know, th these aren't realities that are, that are coming, you know, that God transforms us as we set our eyes on Jesus through his word. Mm -hmm. And so we want to be people of the word. Yeah, so church, um, the gospel, and not only pulls us away from other gods, it not only pulls us away from just religious traditions, it pulls us towards Christ. And it's in Christ where we're rooted and where we're built up. And then as Paul says at the end, it's in Christ where we find peace. And so we want to be a people where the message of Christ dwells among us richly. And that has a transforming power on our hearts and on our lives. And so Matt, do you mind closing us in prayer yeah. as we wrap up? Yeah. Father, we do pray that we would be people of the word, that we would be people who um, the gospel dwells among us richly and in us. And so um, as we close our time together, uh, would you continue to transform us through your word? Thank you for the message of Christ. Thank you um, for the richness of this book. Uh, God, would you use it for your glory, for our joy, um, for our transformation? Um, Father, we love you. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.